I, mean, I want to shift gears a little bit and uh, start talking to you about Acumen's leadership work. Um, and we'll get to Naivasha in a second. My name is Sasha Dichter. I'm our chief innovation officer. Acumen has been investing in leadership since 2006. And I just want to rewind a little more than 10 years. You can imagine you're five years into Acumen's history. We're one of the first patient capital investors. We've put early stage equity into a bunch of fledgling companies who need a lot of things. Um, money, but certainly also skilled people to actually do the work. And the other thing that was different about 2006 was it was a brand new sector. So there were a lot of talented people in the world who had never heard of social enterprise and certainly weren't going to find their way to go work for a company in the Acumen portfolio if there weren't some way to bridge that gap. So those are the two problems we're aiming to solve, a talent need for our companies, and could we bring some of the most talented people into the space so they could eventually become architects for this new social sector. So this is our very first class of 2006 Acumen Fellows. They may not look like future architects of the social sector just yet, <laughs> but just you wait, um, because they were, actually. Um, so Jocelyn Wyatt in the back there went on to find, found IDEO.org. Um, then you've got uh, Eric and Keeley, who created Bamboo Finance, one of the other earliest patient capital investors in the space that co-invested with us in Pakistan, and on and on around the horn. So you've got seven incredible individuals who went to work with our companies and then came back and really helped to create this field. So we kept on having these global fellows, about 10 every year, from 2006 to 2011. And it was the first time we asked ourselves the question of, could this be a bigger part of what Acumen did in the world? And we thought that it could be, but we thought it needed to shift. And to go from being a program where we took people from around the world and put them into our companies to say, we are in country in India, in Pakistan, in East Africa. There are incredible people making change. Can we go directly to them and build a fellows program for them um, that would itself build a pipeline of these future leaders, um, the people who understand how to make change in a complex world, and to just kind of boil it down to its essence. Even at that time, which has gotten clearer since then, we were looking for people who felt comfortable in this kind of space full of contradictions, right? So markets and philanthropy, rich and poor, Sam just used the words of service and ambition. People who could hold ideas that were in tension not reject one or the other, but really embrace both of them, and through that embracing, build new solutions to long-standing problems. That was the thread then, and it continues to be the thread now. And so as we expanded from a global program, we went into East Africa, a program that found social change leaders who were making a difference in their communities, social entrepreneurs, nonprofit leaders. I'll introduce you to some more of them. First in East Africa, followed by Pakistan, and most recently followed by India. So we have 383 of these fellows from all over the world and they're doing pretty incredible work. At the time, one of the moments of pride I remember was when we said, wow, you know, this fellows program is more exclusive than kind of insert elite university here. And at the same time, there was this moment of, wait a minute, you've got literally hundreds and thousands of people from all over the world putting up their hands saying, I want to make change aligned with what Acumen wants to do. And what we were basically sending them was a nice rejection letter. And we had this asset, not only in a curriculum, but amazing partners who had content that we could share. So we began sharing it. And that eventually became Plus Acumen. Joanne is going to share much more about it. But just as a headline number, a quarter million people have taken Plus Acumen courses. And if you can just imagine what that feels like, if you want to talk about ripples, it's incredibly powerful. So now I'll accelerate all the way up to Naivasha. Um, and the framing of this is, while the idea of expanding our leadership work wasn't born here, I really feel like it took root here in a very, very powerful way. And so as you heard in the video, our idea was we've got these nearly 400 fellows. What if we brought them all together in somewhere really easy to get to, like two and a half hours outside of Nairobi, overlooking the Rift Valley? And what if not only that, what if we built like this incredible giant tent and put them all in there? Like that'll be really easy to do. So we did that. We had 300 of our fellows come together. We had about 100 people from the Acumen community, partners, board members, advisors, and other supporters. Um, but I really want to take you inside this tent because very magical things happened there. Now imagine, if you will, it's March of 2017. It's two months after the presidential inauguration in the United States. It is a moment of pulling back. It is a moment of fear. It is a moment of reflection. It is a moment where the world is starting to feel like it's everybody closing off. And then you walk into this tent and you experience something totally different. You experience people from all over the world who are showing up fully and completely with their individuality, with their identity, with their sense of self, and 
an incredible sense of connection through this fellowship, through their values with one another. They were both fully local and fully global. And at that moment, I think every single person in that tent felt, if I could just show the world this, we would be having a different conversation. And I think that's the possibility that we all went again from idea to into our heart to say, there is an opportunity to scale up this work. There is an opportunity to use these fellows programs and what Acumen represents to build what could someday become a virtual university for moral leadership where anybody can come, learn, deepen, and live a life of service and making a difference. And that's what started to happen here. The other thing that was really powerful, you all heard Brian Stevenson for a minute. Brian is an incredible civil rights leader. He defends uh, people on death row. He's regularly argued in front of the Supreme Court. And we got to hear Brian and Ivasha, and I had had the chance to hear him a few times before. Um, I had heard him most recently at the Aspen's Ideas Festival, but hearing Brian at the Aspen Ideas Festival, though still moving, is a different experience. Imagine if well, you've got sort of you know, super, uh, you know, amazing journalist, uh, venture capitalist, you know, head of Microsoft, civil rights attorney, next, 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 next. It was like the shifting to Brian before you went back to kind of your regular programming. When Brian stood up in front of those fellows, what I don't think any of us expected was the congruence between what he represented and what they represented. And of course, Brian's further along on that path. But for the fellows to see, wait a minute, that is what I stand for. That is what I hope to become where I am. And what was also amazing was to talk to Brian afterwards and see how he had been moved. You heard a snippet of it in the video. But his sense of, I am a part of this thing. Although I am working and doing this work in Montgomery, Alabama, I'm connected to all of you. And that really was a powerful thing for us all to see and experience. So vision, if you will, this network of leaders all around the world who are committed to eradicating poverty, they're committed to eradicating injustice, can we accelerate them individually on their path to becoming these leaders? Can we embed them in a cohort of people who will challenge them, who will support them, who will connect them to one another? And ultimately, can we make more change in that way? For those of you who are new or just a little bit of a feel of who some of these fellows are. So Muhammad Ali is one of our Pakistan fellows. And what Muhammad Ali refuses to stand for is the fact that every year there are about 4,000 kids in the city of Karachi in Pakistan who are abducted, most of whom are sold into the sex trade. And so his organization, which is called Roshni Helpline, works to rescue these kids and return them to their parents. And one of the things that Muhammad Ali discovered was the most effective way to get a kid back who has been abducted is if you find out really quickly, get notified, uh, you know, it's those first sort of six to 12 hours that really matter. And so his insight was to say, how do I build a network that will be my eyes and ears on the ground in these neighborhoods where these kids are getting taken away? So he had another leap of faith where he said, are there people who other people aren't seeing who could be my partners in this? And it turns out that the transgender community in Karachi is mostly living on the streets because they themselves are outcasts. And what he saw, instead of outcasts who are homeless in the street, he said, these can be my eyes and ears. So he's actually recruited 2,000 transgender citizens of Karachi to be part of his network, to identify these kids, to be the first responders. Um, so within hours when a kid is getting abducted, it's on you know, flyers and kites and all these sorts of things. And because of that network and because of his willingness, time and time again, to cross lines of difference, they've returned 4,000 kids back to their families. Or then shifting gears to Abbas. So Abbas is one of our India fellows. He went to an elite school in India, one of the IITs in Bombay. So he graduates this incredibly prestigious school, turns his back on whatever other lucrative career he could have had, and decides to become part of the social entrepreneurship space. He starts working in Avanti Learning Centers, which is a successful education technology social enterprise in India. But then Abbas came to Naivasha as well. And he, like many of us, was really touched by Brian Stevenson's words. And in particular, what Brian started talking about was proximity. And what he said was, to solve the issues in the world, you need to get proximate to those issues. That's one of the four steps you need to take. And Abbas, even though he had already taken step after step after step to be part of social change, he came to the conclusion at that moment that he still was not proximate enough to the real challenges in India. And so he left Avanti Learning Centers and went to the state of Chhattisgarh. But he didn't just show up there. He went there to connect with another uh, Acumen India fellow in a state that has a lot of violence, a lot of poverty. And he decided that he's going to go work for an Acumen India fellow 
named Ashish, who is in Chhattisgarh working with kids and educating them because, again, that is his further step and further step towards the proximity he feels like he needs to have to ultimately become the agent of change he'd like to become. Or finally, quickly moving to East Africa, Teresa, who you also heard in the video. I had the chance to meet Teresa a few years back in our first seminar in Nairobi, and she shared kind of at a high level that she had been wrongfully incarcerated. Um, what happened was Teresa was working at a prestigious financial institution. She was near what turned out to be a fraudulent transaction. She had nothing to do with that transaction. But what she had shared on stage, which I hadn't heard before, was in the process of her going through the judicial system in Kenya. There were two specific moments where she had been asked, first for, I think it was a million shillings and then five million shillings, as a bribe, very clearly, if you pay this, you don't go to jail. And she decided not to pay those bribes, and she went to jail. But at that moment, when I see this photograph of Teresa in a prison, Yes, I see inmates around her, um, but you don't just see criminals. What you see are people who are either unable or unwilling to pay those same bribes to keep themselves out of jail. And so when she says, I'm now starting Clean Start to give these people a fresh start to reintegrate into society, you can see someone who's going a step further to do really what's right and not just what's easy to solve some of the problems and challenges that she sees around her. And so our vision is to literally expand that tent. We have programs right now in three geographies, in India, Pakistan, and East Africa. We'd like to get to 15 geographies by 2020, um, which feels like a lot. But the, our secret weapon is these global fellows. right? And so we are actually in the process now of working with these five global fellows in Australia, in the Middle East, in Colombia, Malaysia. And for those of you who get extra credit, the young woman, uh, not as young anymore, uh, in Bangladesh is 10 years later the woman from that first class of fellows who has been working for the last 10 years in leadership development in Bangladesh. So we're working to partner with them so they can raise the flag for the Ackman Fellows Program in their geography. And our job, again, as Carlisle said at the beginning, is to kind of be the fuel behind them, to give them the curriculum and the content so they can be entrepreneurs to bring the leadership development that's need, needed in their geographies. And the second thing we're doing is actually shifting our Global Fellows Program. So as I mentioned at the beginning, the Global Fellows Program started at a different time. It has been wildly successful, so successful that a lot of other programs have come around and, well, I don't want to say copied, but I can't think of another word. So they copied the Global <laughs> Fellows Program. And the other thing that's changed is the sector is in a radically different place. At the time, if you went to a top school wherever and wanted to come into this space, it was extremely difficult that you could find your way. But now, the world has changed, the sector has changed, so we don't feel that what, act, what the world needs most from Acumen today is a way to get into the social sector. What we would like to do is create a program that is for the 400 fellows, 500, 600, by 2020 we'll have 1,000 of these fellows so they can go deeper. People that we have known for their time in the fellowship program who, who want to deepen their understanding and their practice of moral leadership so they can stand taller, so they can make more change and really be a leverage point for that entire community. And finally, plus acumen, Joanne will really go deeper into this, but imagine the asset that we have in this online learning platform that can connect all of these fellows that can be um, a learning center for all of them. And all I'll say before turning it over to Joanne is it's really two paths to the same destination. How do we give the right people the tools, the community, the connectivity to really make the change that they're trying to make in the world? Um, that's really what we're trying to do. So I'll turn it over to Joanne for uh, a little more.